three. I just, I really enjoy singing songs that, you know, aren't the standard, this is what we always sing songs, because you, you have to read the words and, and pay attention to them. And two of those songs this evening are less familiar to most of us, and they there's a lot of benefit in that. Don't resent having to learn something new, uh, by the way, folks. Uh, but don't don't overdo it, Charlie, for crying out loud. It can only handle so much. So... <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 23. Are you there? Yes, sir. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Brother John says yes, sir, because he just looks it up on his digital thing. It's there. Isn't it? <laughs> you still have to be able to read, right? So, <laughs> Are you, Would you look down at verse, at verse uh, 13? Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbade, forbear to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul saw him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood, and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth. And they two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Father, I pray that you would help us this evening, just as we're looking at the character of individuals, and we're looking at how it is that good men can, can change for bad, and how that bad men can change for good. And Lord, as we see these, these truths and these things, I pray that you would help us to look to a God who is able to use all kinds of men. And may we ultimately really just see your hand, the kind of God that you are, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who was David's chief rival, would you say? What? Saul. 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 Everybody says Saul. Wrong! No. <laughs> Trick question. Uh, I was hoping you'd say Saul. That way I could say wrong. Uh, it's Sunday night, folks. Smile a little bit, okay? We're, we're enjoying the day. But uh, who was David's chief rival? Well, actually, uh, Saul could have been a father to David. In other words, Saul would have been to Jesse. Uh, age-wise, what David was. David wasn't trying to replace Saul. David was in, next in line to be king. And so if David's next in line to be king, and whose determination was it that David would be next in line to be king? God. God. Whose determination was it that Saul would be the first king of Israel? God's. Okay, so based on God's, uh, based on God's will, God's desire, Saul was the man that was supposed to be first king of Israel. We saw in 1 Samuel, we've really seen the kind of man Saul was. He was excellent as he began. A man of great strength, great courage, great humility. I mean, his, if you were to take Saul's greatest characteristic, he was handsome, he was tall, he was, he was you know, this kingly deportment about his persona. Uh, but the thing that really made him great was his humility. Uh, you know... Not to mistake humility for weakness. He wasn't a weak man. He hid himself in the stuff when he was called to be king of Israel because he was humble. But when a tribe of Israel were told, you be our servants, and we're going to pop out your right eye, and uh, these people are cowering and vacillating before the heathen, Saul took his oxen, chopped them up, and sent them around the, the country and said, if you don't show up, I'm going to do this to you. We're fighting. Saul was not a coward. Saul was not a weak man. He was a strong man with great humility. And when he became it, king of Israel, aside from the fact that Israel had done wrong in asking God for a king, Saul was the best man in the country. But it changed. And we know the summary of what happened when he changed, don't we? When he was little in his own sight, he's a good man. But when he became great in his own sight, he was presumptuous. He did things, took upon himself 
the right that he did not have. Did things that sane individuals wouldn't do. He offered a sacrifice that the priest was supposed to offer. God told him to go to battle and fight this way. and He did it in a way that he thought was better. He not only thought that he had the right to stand in the place that only Samuel could be in, but he thought that he could make decisions that were better than God's decision. And so he really was a mess. The worst thing about King Saul was that he didn't humble himself. When I look at the contrast between King David and King Saul, I see two men who were great men but flawed. I mean, they, they, in their greatness, they were great. In their flaws, they were great. <coughs> David's adultery, his murder, is unconscionable. I mean, a guy like David, I'd have, you know, God says forgive him, I'd forgive him. But I wouldn't know to otherwise, would you? Uh, Ahithophel never did. Bathsheba's grandfather died of bitterness because he couldn't forgive David because of what David had done to his granddaughter and his grandson-in-law way that he disgraced his household. So, when I contrast the difference between the two, what's the difference between Saul and David? Well, David's a guy that fell on his face. said, I've sinned. And Saul said, honor me now in front of the people. Don't let anybody know that I'm in trouble. Make, let's, let's make everything look like it's okay. And that was his response. And so good people change for bad. And uh, bad people can also change for good. But people change. Don't you hate that little line that people use? People never change. You know, sometimes people think they can't change. If you're here this evening and you've been <coughs> defeated, and you've tried, and you've been defeated, and you've really tried, you've given it your utmost, and you've fallen again, can I say to you, you can't change, but God can change you. <coughs> A lot of times we think, you know, we'll say about somebody, you know, he'll never change, she'll never change. Well, in their own strength, that's true. But with God's help, anyone can change. And it takes the kind of humility to fall on your face and say, without God's help, God, I need help. And that's really the difference between David and Saul when it comes down to it. The question, who's David's chief rival? Jonathan is. Jonathan's David's chief rival because... Because if Saul had not rebelled, Jonathan would be next in line to be king of Israel. And as I look at Jonathan's life, I see uh, Jonathan is perhaps, he is uh, he's the top. He's the equal of my favorite Bible characters. Men I look at in the Scripture, Jonathan's it. Matter of fact, I've always gravitated toward the man's man kind of guys. Uh, not to not to bash on you sissy men or anything like that, but uh, I Jonathan's that wasn't nice, was it? Who's this? There's no sissy men here. Not a single. Don't look around. I'm not talking about anybody in this room. Okay, you all stop. Like, okay, I know who it is. Why are they looking at you, Luke? That's not nice. You're not. A, Luke's got a cowboy hat and he's wearing boots right now. So leave the guy the camo boots. All right, Jonathan's a man's man though, isn't he? I mean, the guy says to his armor bearer. Let's go up to the garrison of the Philistines. hundred people. Who knows? You know, who can say if the Lord will save by a few or many? This is, to, to God, what difference is it if two guys beat a hundred or if a thousand guys beat a hundred? It's God that's going to do it anyway. He's not just a man's man. He's a God-fearing man. You know, he's a guy that knows that with God, anything's possible. I mean, he's David. He's, he's the same attitude David had when he fought Goliath. Who's, who is this that's blaspheming the Most High God? I mean, who is this guy? This little giant here. Who does he think he is? You know, and that's, I mean, you've got to admire the courage of David, don't you? Because they know who God is, and so in comparison with God, everybody's pretty small. Sort of like a five year old that's got a big, strong dad. You know? Everybody knows that your dad is the strongest man in the world, right? It, you should know that if you don't know it. If not wrestling sometime, you'll figure out. You know, if you're five 
or so. I mean, when my dad used to come home from work, we all piled, grabbed a hold of his legs, and we rode his boots as he walked through the living room. You know, when you get on somebody's boots and they walk through the living room, you ride them, they're pretty strong. You know, and my dad was the strongest man in the world. I remember when I was a kid, lived on the farm, and we had coyotes howling at night. You know, you know y'all would never live in a, in a barren place and hear nothing but, Aw! And they started the packs, and they start circling the house. It's scary when you're a little kid. So I remember having a, you know, a, a, a serious conversation with my dad. I was probably three or four, and uh, I asked him. I said, "So, uh, you know, coyotes? You, know, you hear them? You don't see them? Coyotes? Uh, what do they look like?" He said, "Well, they look like dogs." I said, oh, "Okay." I said, "Can Zach? Uh, that's our dog. He was a shepherd collie. Could Zach? Uh, could could he uh, kill a coyote?" My dad said, well, you know, coyotes usually run in packs. So, um, you know, one-on-one, -on -one he, he might be okay, but a coyote's wild and a dog isn't. And so maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. I think Zach could have, but, you know, he says maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. Um, but, uh, you know, usually they, coyotes, you know, they lure you out. They, they get a dog to come away from the house, and then the pack attacks them. You know, I was like, oh, be careful going outside. If they could do that to Zach, you know, pretty small. And I remember asking my dad. Uh, so I had several. I remember this particular night. I had several serious conversations with my dad. I also was asking him about why people say they don't have a dime, when actually they have a dime. And I'm so broke I don't have a dime. And I'm like I saw you said told mom you didn't have a dime, but I saw you had dimes. You know you shouldn't say that. If he's like well it's just saying. I was like well if it's not true you shouldn't say it. I remember telling my dad that that night. The philosophical three-year-old. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I have a pretty good memory. For, I don't have a good memory today, but I can remember a lot from when I was a kid. But I remember, you know, I was asking, you know, sort of concerned questions for other people. Of course, probably my brother and sister wanted to know how dangerous coyotes were. And uh, so I was asking probably for other people, you know, how dangerous coyotes were. And I, I was asking my dad about them, and, and I remember him saying, I said, what would keep a coyote from getting a kid? Not me, but, you know, <laughs> some other kid, you know. And he said, well, they're scared of me. He said, if a coyote came, I'd grab it and kill it. I've always hung out with my dad ever since. <laughs> he said, I just, I say, he said I just, I'd hold their mouth shut and I'd strangle them. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. Now, I believe that my dad could do that. My dad probably could do that. I don't know. That guy strangled a, a mountain lion, 30-pound one, but a mountain lion in Colorado. Did y'all see that in the news a while back? Man's attacked by a mountain lion. But uh, I think it was my brother sent me a picture of it. The mountain lion was 30 pounds. It wasn't a 120-pound mountain lion. It was a 30-pound. It, it was a baby mountain lion. It was a kitten that he strangled. But regardless, you know. Uh, so if you could strangle a 30-pound mountain lion, you'd probably strangle a 30-pound coyote. But I, I took a lot of solace in the fact that my my dad had the strength that he had. Now, what in the world does it have to do with anything? I just go off telling a story about something. Somewhere along the line, that had to do with something. I better get back up and look at my text for just a second. So we're talking about oh, we're talking about Jonathan and David. And the reality of it. Is, okay, here's here's what it is. So the truth of the matter is that in comparison with any man, God's big. And God's bigger than any man can be. There's nothing that's that's that is there's nothing powerful in comparison with God. I I just thrill to read the end of everything, the revelation, when we see the ending of the devil. And God tells an angel, lock him up. God doesn't have this, you know, we think of this epic war between God and Satan. And God doesn't even have, I mean, they're just not on the same level. God says, lock him up. And an angel takes the devil and locks him up. You know, that's how big God is. And Jonathan knew that. And David knew that. Jonathan said, who knows if God was saved by a few or many? What difference does it make? If God wants to give us this battle, let's have it. Let's have the victory. Who cares if it's two guys? I just like a guy like that, don't you? I mean, that's a man. You know, he says God's big. God can do anything. And man, I'll tell you, God uses men like that. God was using... Jonathan, and, I, and you, you've heard me say it before, I think Jonathan would have been a great king. Does anybody agree with that? I think he would have. 
Saul was upset. He told himself, remember the time when he tried to kill Jonathan? And he said, you know, you, you son of a rebellious woman. And he, that wasn't a nice thing to say about his wife, was it? <laughs> but he said, you son of a rebellious woman. And he said, don't you know, another time, don't you know that David is trying to have your throne? He wasn't trying to have Saul's throne in Saul's mind. He's trying to have Jonathan's throne. And so Jonathan's greatest rival, or David's greatest rival, was one another. And so when you ask the question, it was a trick question. It was intended to be. I'm glad you got it wrong. It makes me feel good. Uh, but <laughs> when he asked the question, who was Jonathan or who was David's greatest rival? It wasn't Saul. It was Jonathan. <clears throat> Let's go to the beginning of the chapter, the passage that we were reading here in, in verse 23. Uh, they, they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Well, therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. And then David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here. And we, I like the way they say this too. We be afraid here in Judah. <laughs> How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? David inquired the Lord yet again. The Lord answered and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And so David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Popular guy in Keilah? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He's their friend. Uh, and then he, Abiathar came down there. Now go to verse 7. It was told Saul that David was come to Keilah and Saul said, notice this, this is, this is ironic that Saul would think this. God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. Can't catch him when he's in the country. He's too quick and too wily. But in town, lock the doors and search house to house. We've got this guy. And uh, nine, verse 9, David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. And said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Now stop here and let's go back to, uh, before we read verse 11, let's go back to verse 5. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Good guy? Popular guy? Yes. Now read verse 11. David asked God, Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Now, how's that for loyalty? That's terrible, isn't it? I mean, it's just something I can't stand. It's a backstabbing traitor. And these people, Keilah, owe their existence. They're being robbed blind by the Philistines. They're being mistreated. They're being made slaves and servants and killed. David comes in his 600 men and delivers them. Not only delivers them, but also captures spoil from the Philistines and gives it to them. They're, he's their friend. And rumors out, word on the street is that if, or is that Saul is thinking about, that he knows David's there and he thinks he's walled into the city. Saul's thinking about coming to besiege the city. And David's got two questions to God. First of all, Saul coming. God said, yeah, he is. Second question, would the men of Keilah betray me? Would they deliver me up to Saul? And the answer is, yeah, they would. Saul's pretty, or David's pretty well used to betrayal, isn't he? That's really what delineates the difference between a lot of the people in Israel and his mighty men. His mighty men were loyal to him, but you know what kind of guys they were? They were people that were disgruntled. They were the kind of people in Israel that, you know, were in trouble with the law. They were kind of the outcasts in Judah. So here's a guy living with a bunch of outcasts. And then he goes to a city and really does them a favor. And is, they're willing to just betray him. Let Saul kill him. 
That's pretty discouraging. Now, if you were to ask the question, who's David's best friend? Now, we, we know the end of the story, don't we? know Jonathan is. But I just want to contrast a little bit with the kind of a man that Jonathan was, despite circumstances and the way that people oftentimes are. And it's a character study for us this evening of what a man ought to be. Uh, look, at, look at the circumstance in verse... Now, before we do that, though, let me just say this. We could grant, we could accept, couldn't we, that nothing happens without God's allowing it. David knew that, Jonathan knew that, but a lot of people don't function that way. When Saul was rejected from his seed being in the lineage of Christ, from having a seed on the throne forever, Saul didn't accept that. Uh, when Saul was told, you've been rejected from being king, he didn't accept that. David was not willing to touch the Lord's anointed. If we read previous to this and after this, we'd see circumstances where David could have killed Saul and wasn't willing to do so. Even in defense of his own life, he just fled. Because he wasn't willing to touch God's anointed. See, the difference in attitude between Saul, Jonathan, and David. Jonathan and David would be in one category, and Saul in another was that Jonathan and David just believed that God could do anything. And Saul had come to the place where he believed he could do anything. On the one hand, you have a man who is a traitor to his own people, Saul. Saul was a traitor. David was his most loyal servant. You remember what, uh, I, what uh, the priest Ahimelech said? Ahimelech said, you don't have a more loyal servant than King David. Is it, wasn't David, he's, he works for you, he represents you, you don't have a better servant than him. Well, that part was true, and Ahimelech was right about it. it. didn't stop Saul from killing Ahimelech. But David was loyal to Saul. Saul wasn't loyal to David. You know, when people betray you, sometimes you come to the realization that a lot of people are, they talk a good talk, but they don't do what they say. A lot of people speak about things like loyalty and courage, but when the rubber meets the road, they're not what they claim to be. You'll meet believers who are not what they purport or portray themselves to be. <clears throat> but what I love about Jonathan is, and David is that these are two men who know the reality of life. David knew that the men at Keilah owed him loyalty, but he also knew that they probably weren't loyal. They should have been, but he knew they probably weren't. Doeg the Edomite had betrayed him. A lot of people had betrayed Saul, or, will, or betrayed David, and were willing to backstab him, to do him wrong. You know what happens sometimes when you realize that people will betray you? You can become sort of jaded in your thinking, can't you? And I've met men in the ministry that just think people, you know, they just say, well, people are all fake. I've met guys that are working jobs where you're supposed to be making a difference in people's lives that think that nothing makes a difference. I remember this one time. It made an impression on me, and it helped me with my thinking. Uh, I was in seminary at the time, and I lived on the worst street in town, downtown Green Street in Pensacola. It was a fun area to live. Uh, I got new neighbors every six months. They about 27, I counted 27 one time, sheriff cars came whipping down my street, you know, full speed. They would fly by my house. And then all my neighbors were gone, and then I'd get a new set. And then six months later, come back in, and same thing. Well, I would take my kids in my neighborhood to youth group. And uh, <laughs> I got pulled over one time because I pulled up in my car to one of the teenagers and he was talking to me and so forth and then I pulled away and I got pulled over and the sheriff said I want to know what you're doing in this neighborhood I said well, I live right there you know that's what I'm doing here oh well who's this kid you're talking to you know and I said well you know he goes to my youth group and he said well he's a known drug dealer and I said well he goes to my youth group you know I'm trying to trying to reach him and uh, he said this he said you can take the man out of the ghetto but you can't take the ghetto out of the man. 
And I don't think I said what I thought about saying in response to that. But here's the deal. Don't be a sheriff if you don't think you can make a difference. I mean, seriously. You ever met a law enforcement officer that felt like everybody was a criminal, mm -hmm. including law enforcement officers? Like I said, everybody's a, everybody's a criminal. Everybody is. There's no good people. You know, and they'll say, well, you know, anybody could do anything. Well, that is true. But, you know, there's this thing called character that prevents people from doing anything that could be done in some individuals. And, you know, that's Jonathan. It's Jonathan. See, Jonathan could have a day when he really thinks it through and thinks, you know, if it weren't for David. You know, he could have that thought. But, you know, the thing about Jonathan is that he'd say, but you know what? God wants David. That's Jonathan. So here's this encounter, here's this conversation between these two men. We know that at first Jonathan didn't believe that Saul really wanted to kill David, and so of course he tested him by uh, saying that he gave him permission to go home, and, and when they had the feast, that's, you know, I think that's when Jonathan got called the son of a rebellious woman. And uh, David told Jonathan had shot his arrows. Remember, so the arrows are they're beyond thee, and go, you know, keep keep going, keep flying, because the arrows are beyond you. And they had their conversation, promised loyalty to each other. For the first time that David met Saul, you remember remember the first or Jonathan met Saul. Remember their encounter, the first time they met each other. <clears throat> remember what happened? Jonathan took his took his bow and his he took his 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 armor and, and he gave him to David, and just you know. And the Bible says their souls were knit. What was the connection between these two men, Jonathan and David? What was the connection? Well, they both had an upwards connection with God, didn't they? Jonathan had a high view of who God is, and David had a high view of who God is as well. And I think that that's the thing that really helped them to connect. They recognized, not in each other, but they recognized that each other recognized who God was. And they had this connection. I have to be honest with you. If I'm Jonathan and I'm sitting alone, I'm having thoughts, I'm thinking, you know, David's maybe not my friend. He's going to replace me. He's going to take the place that I grew up thinking I was going to have. If I'm David and I'm thinking, you know something? All it would take is one time for Jonathan to change his mind and I'd be dead. It's interesting that they come to this place uh, David has left Keilah and he's out hiding in the forest. He's in the woods. This is not Robin Hood, but it's probably where Robin Hood's story comes from. And in verse 15, David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And notice verse 16. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood. You ever just examine that statement? Saul's hunting him everywhere in the world and can't find him. And Jonathan just goes, well, you see, oh, there he is. I mean, Jonathan can just find him. Now think about, the, think about that for just a second. Why do you suppose that is? Well, I think that it would be a little bit true to say David wasn't hiding from Jonathan. He was hiding from Saul. But I mean, Jonathan just went, yeah, here's David. Saul can't find him anywhere. And his son just goes, hey, David, what's up? He just goes right to him. It's just that simple. Humanly speaking, you could look at that and you could say, you know, if Jonathan wanted to, he could kill David. Yeah, David, I know David killed Goliath, and I know David and the mighty things that he did, but look, study up on Jonathan sometime. I would say that he was at least an equal with David, physically. I don't think Jonathan was less of a man in battle than David was. And that's saying a lot, isn't it? Probably there's never been a man alive who was as bad a dude, if you want to put it that way, as David. I just hand-on-hand -hand combat uh, with a weapon, whatever. David was the most dangerous man alive. And I'm talking about, you know, guys like Samson that had supernatural power, you know, he wasn't anything. He wasn't anything like the man, the, the warrior that David was. And Jonathan just goes and finds him in the woods when he's trying not to be found. And that's ironic, isn't it? And so you look at it and you you're thinking, what would David have thought? 
Well, there's two things to it. First of all, David wasn't concerned about Jonathan finding him. And uh, Jonathan wasn't concerned uh, about David. And the reason why is because <coughs> neither of them were jaded about loyalty. David knew that Jonathan was his friend. And Jonathan knew David was his friend. You know, it's encouraging sometimes because we can always just look at the negatives, can't we? You know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease is a pretty accurate statement. But there's three other wheels, unless it's an 18-wheeler. <laughs> right? In other words, it's always a minority that makes the loudest noise and makes it seem like they're the one that represents everybody. You have this loud, punk, you know, whatever person that'll say, we all think... And nobody stands up and says, well, don't count me in that we all, because I don't think that. You know, the, the silent people usually don't think what the loud people are saying, do they? There's a lot of silent people out there. And sometimes we just get to thinking everybody's bad, everybody's fake, there's no real Christians. There's, you know, and I, I recognize that Jesus is the only perfect, the only person who's ever been perfect, that's ever lived on this earth, is God's Son. But you know, God has some wonderful servants too. And we as believers need to come to the place where we just recognize the good in folks. We know what it is when somebody's not loyal. You know, it's, it's a reality check for us sometimes. I know what that is. But you know something? Not everybody's that way. And I find that nugget, that truth in this relationship between David and Jonathan, a refreshing one. Don't you? <clears throat> because Jonathan is still David's friend. And then look what Jonathan says here. And this just kind of cements the whole character thing. In verse 17, he said unto him, Fear not. Well, that kind of helps you understand the tone when he finds David, doesn't it? He went to David in the wood. He said unto him, Fear not. Don't be afraid. For the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. Now how does he know that? How does Jonathan know David, I mean, remember the time David said, I shall one day die at the hand of King Saul. Remember that? How does Jonathan know that Saul is never going to catch David? Because he knows God. God said, you're going to be king of Israel. And Jonathan says, well, God says he's going to be king of Israel. That's it. That settles it. That's good enough for me. So don't be afraid that the, the hand of, you know, my, Saul, my father, he's not going to find you. And he, and he said, not only that, he said, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And he said, and that also Saul my father knoweth. I said, and dad knows it too. Well, what a statement that is. Mm -hmm. Now how low do you think David is feeling? First thing we saw this evening is that not everybody is a traitor. Not everybody is disloyal. Uh, you don't have to go around just thinking, I just can't trust anyone. Well, you have to know when you can't trust someone. That's a reality. And David found that out. Well, there's a guy he can trust, and it's his friend Jonathan. And you know what else his friend Jonathan is? He's an encourager. He's an encourager. David's a fugitive hiding in the woods, and Jonathan finds him and says, Fear not. He said, First of all, Dad's not going to find you. Second of all, someday you're going to be king of Israel. Third of all, I support you. I'm going to be next unto you. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be your right hand man, David. Whatever you need, I will be your most loyal servant. And then he said, and Dad knows it too. There's just nothing like a confidence booster when somebody comes and just says something that's true, isn't it? You know, we as believers need to learn the power of words. And I'll tell you, James talks about the power of words, doesn't he? Proverbs talks about the power of words. Man, words can destroy Words can just literally cut someone up. But you know what words can also do? Words can strengthen and encourage. You know something? Hey, you're going through a tough time right now. But God also knows about it. He's a great God, isn't He? And you know something? You're going to be just fine. You know, I don't know how many times in my life somebody's just come to me and said, you know, it's going to be all right. And it wasn't because they were the one that was that I was depending on for it to be alright, but just good to hear somebody that knows God the same way and believes everything's going to be alright. You know, you appreciate encouragement like that. <clears throat> you and I, we need to be those kind of encouragers. 
You know, there's a lot of traitors in this world, aren't there? There are many, many traitors. Many people that are disloyal. In the highest of, and most important of relationships. But you know, you and I can be loyal in relationships. And you know what else we can do? We can be the kind of people that not only are loyal, but encourage people. Strengthen them in the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, I just look up to Jonathan in this, don't you? He's just a... He's a strong, courageous man. He's got the humility his father used to have. He's a servant of David. He always was David's servant. Just always David's friend, right? First time he met him, just hugged him, gave him his, gave him his, his, his privileged, princely military implements. And here when his own father has betrayed David, he says, you know, Dad knows it. He's not admitting it, but he knows. He knows that you're going to be king of Israel someday. And it's all going to be okay, David. What a great friend he is. I asked at the beginning, who was David's chief rival? Who ought to have been his chief rival? Well, Jonathan. Jonathan should have been. But because of who God was, and who each of these men were in relationship to God, who was David's best friend? Charlie, move the camera, man. You're missing me. Whew. All right. <laughs> Who was David's best friend? Huh? Jonathan was. Pastor, loyalty is tough. It's hard to be loyal to somebody, especially when it costs you as much as it costs Jonathan. Well, I don't think it was easy for Jonathan, do you? I'll tell you what. Sure, good thing he... He handled things the way he did. He ended the way he did. But Jonathan's been with the Lord a number of years now. Boy, he's got a stellar reputation. And he's a great example to us even tonight. And that's why I feel like when you have a little passage of Scripture like this and, and you're looking at the transition period between the judges and the kings of Israel, it's important to give Jonathan plenty of time in this. Because he's the right kind of an example. He gives us a good perspective on who God is, on what real loyalty is, and what friendship is. And friend, if you're what God wants you to be, you'll be just like Him. And so, there's a little bit of a convicting example there as well. Are you loyal to somebody to your own hurt? Jonathan was loyal to his own hurt, humanly speaking. Do you value God and His ability to the degree that really everything else pales in comparison? Because that was Jonathan. Jonathan said, you know, God can do anything. If this is what God wants, this is what's going to happen. Saul can't kill you, David. My dad can't kill you. It can't happen. Why? Because of God. Because of who God is. And you know, friend, you get a gaze at God the way Jonathan did. You get to know God in that way. Life circumstances won't be much of a problem for you. You never see Jonathan wringing his hands and trying to figure out what he's going to do next. He had a good vision, a good direct line where he could see who God was. And you just find Jonathan always doing right. And being one of the best men who ever lived because of it. And so he's a great example for us. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening, both about you as well as servants that please you. I pray that you would help us to emulate these things that are part of character that you want us to have, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your great attention and your good sense of humor this evening. You're dismissed. Preacher? Yes, sir.